All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Florian Dombrin. Uh, I'm French, but I'm going to do this talk in English. Um, I'm uh, actually uh, currently DevOps engineer at GamGam. Um, I will talk a bit later on about GamGam. Uh, but today's talk is about test-driven infrastructure uh, with Ansible, Docker, and Jenkins. Uh, so we're going to get started because I have a lot of things to cover today. Um, and thanks for joining me today. I hope that you won't be too disappointed. Uh, that's maybe not the talk you expected, but at least you, we will talk a bit about Docker. Um, so like I say, I'm DevOps engineer for GamGam. I joined GamGam uh, two years and a half ago. Um, that's a um, Californian startup based in uh, Santa Monica, Los Angeles area. And uh, I'm an Ansible fan. Uh, I actually introduced Ansible uh, at GamGam, and you will see uh, how we use uh, all this uh, platform to test our automations today. Um, let me tell you a bit more about GamGam. Uh, GamGam is a computer vision company um, which uh, invented, um, which has the capabilities to detect objects and human features in images. So we use that capabilities for several products. One product that we introduced in 2008 is called the in-image advertising. So we basically overlay an ad on top of an image based, based on the content of that image. So as you can see here, there's a woman in that image, and this advertiser called L'Oreal asks us to detect all kinds of women in pictures and overlay their ads uh, on top of it. Um, so we own a patent for in-image advertising. A second product uh, on the right side, which is completely different, is what we call um, the um, it's what we call the um, our, our platform to detect uh, detect logos and uh, brown logos. So we basically go through um, images uh, on uh, social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram and a Tumblr, and we try to, de to detect all kinds of logos. So as you can see here, we try to detect uh, Nike logos. And what will interest Nikes uh, is to know who are the people tweeting about those Nike pictures. Are they tweeting about these photos happily or angrily? Uh, what is the breakup between men and women, or between like different ages? Um, so we basically, what would interest Nike in that kind of analysis is to know their social footprint based on all these images. On the other side, a company like Adidas would also be interested about uh, Nike's social footprint because you're always interested in your, social, in your own social footprint as well as uh, your competitor's social footprint. So that's basically the two products uh, that we run uh, at GumGum. Let's talk about today's agenda, um, where I will uh, quickly introduce you to um, Ansible concepts. Uh, I, haven't time to, I don't have time to go through, like, too deep in those concepts, so we'll just go over a uh, quick overview. And then I will focus on these uh, two parts, which is uh, test-driven infrastructure. Uh, so we will talk about uh, our main workflows at GumGum. Then uh, our Ansible can ease some, some testing around the automation where um, we can use Ansible test modules and how we leverage Docker in that test process. And then we'll talk about a few uh, test frameworks that we can use around all these automations. And the second part of this talk is going to be actually a demo where we're going to see how to use Jenkins pipelines uh, in our workflows and uh, how to build um, a test, so how to build an automation from scratch and uh, have it like running on Jenkins pipeline and it's uh, fully tested. Let's quickly go over uh, all our goals. Um, so why we decided to build this uh, infrastructure to test automation. So usually when you when you are on the software um, software engineering side, you work on unit testing, integration testing, and you run all those all those jobs on the Jenkins server. Um, now, on the ops side, it's quite different. Uh, so we used to build automation, but what about testing them? So we wanted to make sure that our automation worked as expected. It's not because you're building something that is running that your web app is running at the end or it's listening on the correct ports and it doesn't crash right after starting. So we want to make sure everything is working properly. We also want to detect breaking changes earlier where 
usually we run with a lot of dependencies in our automation. We have like common blocks that we're going to reuse in all, all those automations. So we just want to make sure that if someone changes a Java role, we're not going to break the whole stack that relies on Java. We want also to uh, handle configuration management tool upgrades, where if I upgrade my, in my case, uh, Ansible version, I want to make sure all my, uh, all my automations are going to still work as expected. Um, I also want to test automation software upgrades where, for example, um, with Elasticsearch, uh, before we're using Elasticsearch uh, version 1, and when, w when they release the version 2, the question is, is my Elasticsearch automation uh, working with version 1 as well as version 2. So that kind of platform can help us to test all this in a test uh, environment and make sure it's going to work in production. We also want to test uh, complex infrastructure configuration where at GamGam we rely on a lot of uh, big data technologies uh, like Kafka, Storm, C uh, Cassandra. So all those clusters usually require different pieces to work. Um, so the example is a Zookeeper cluster. Uh, which is a cluster that provides a core room, and it is used in many different uh, big data technologies. The other use case I mentioned is uh, Cassandra, where we usually need the op center uh, server that's going to collect metrics across all the nodes. And we also want maybe to run our uh, automation that are going to perform maintenance on the cluster, or also rolling restarts. And uh, we want uh, to enforce uh, automation best practices. So when you usually work on the software engineering side, you're going to use um, tools like CheckStyle or stuff like that. So we want to make sure we can apply these kind of tools uh, on the ops side. Let's quickly talk about Ansible. Um, how many of you have heard about Ansible? Sweet. How many of you are using Ansible every day? Cool, OK. Um, so actually, that's great, because that's just a really quick overview. I'm not going to be too long on that. That's an open source project that was released in 2012. It uh, was started by Michael Deanne. Um, this is uh, written in, p in Python. And it's used as a configuration management tool, an orchestration tool, and an application deployment tool. It's a push-based system, and it's uh, agentless. So we have like some other people that are uh, using Ansible a lot uh, with uh, network devices. And Ansible is great for that, because there is no agent that needs to be on the router. Um, it can also work as a, um, in a pool mode, uh, but basically Ansible is meant to do push. Um, so it's a well, um, I would say it's a well-maintained uh, project with a, a strong community behind. And uh, it's a project that is um, moving fast and that was able to embrace uh, the, Docker, uh, the, the Docker containers uh, in, that, um, in that tool. So you, we will see later on how Ansible can work really well with Docker. For those who are not familiar with Ansible, I just dropped a really quick, simple example. Um, so the first step here, this is uh, what we call the playbook. Um, in other words, it could be like a chef recipe, or I guess uh, in the puppet world it's called a manifest. So in that playbook, you will uh, first give it a name, and uh, we will specify against which uh, targets we want to run that playbook. In that case, it's meant for web servers. And the become statement just means that we want to become root on the machine. And then we're going to list a set of tasks that we want to run across this uh, host that we're going to call inventory. And we, here we're going to do like a bunch of statements. So we just want to install Nginx, remove any kind of default configuration, and restart the service to make sure that it's, it doesn't take into account this uh, old configuration. And this is the part I was talking about here, the web servers inventory. We're going to find here a list of hosts. So in that case, I just drop a static file where we're just going to list all the DNSs or pub, uh, public or private IPs. But you can work with what we call dynamic inventories, where um, Ansible is going to interact with AWS or uh, Google Cloud or whatever cl uh, cloud provider um, you, can, um, you can come up with. So this script allows you just to uh, dynamically grab all these hosts without having to maintain this list of hosts um, by yourself. 
Uh, on this side, this is how you call uh, this, uh, this, uh, this playbook. So we're just going to run uh, the web servers.yaml playbook. And we're going to specify Ansible that we want to use the uh, web app inventory that we have right there. And this is like the execution steps, uh, so the output of the Ansible execution. Now let's talk about um, our two main workflows at GumGum with automations. Well, when, when we start, when we provision new servers, we usually have um, one, um, we usually follow this path, which is a cluster or a, a standalone server uh, provision. So this, uh, this cluster is gonna just going to be started by Ansible, automated with it, and we're going to leave it there. So we usually follow all these steps. Uh, so we try to uh, tag different parts in our playbooks where we we're going to first provision the uh, EC2 servers uh, because GamGam -Gam relies a lot on AWS. So we're going to manage all these servers and start the number of servers that we want with the correct type and uh, all the disks that we, that we need. And then we're going to run uh, the configuration part, which is going to install whatever software we want to deploy on the server. And finally, we have um, um, a part which is called test, which is uh, th the goal of this part is just to start the server and make sure it's running and listening on the correct port and your application is actually started. The other workflow uh, we follow here is uh, the image creation, uh, in other term, the AMI uh, creation. So we're going to follow exactly the same steps here, provision, configure, and test, but then we're going to run a cleanup part, uh, clean up cleanup tasks that we want to stop the service, clean up the logs, and make sure the server is clean and uh, ready to be restarted. And finally, we're going to also use Ansible to trigger the uh, image creation process. So we're going to build an AMI uh, using Ansible. We're going to stop the server, create the AMI, and we can even go further where we can ask Ansible to go through the whole process and at the end restart a new server based on this AMI that was just created. So that allows us to um, have like a full workflow when we create uh, AMIs. This is, um, this is how our uh, playbook look like uh, when we, I mean, to uh, achieve these two um, main workflows that we've seen before. Uh, First part here is where we're going to grab the right variables that we need to know how many servers we need. Am I provisioning a cluster? Do I need multiple servers? So all these variables are going to define how many, which subnet, which VPC I want to start my instances in. And we're going to call the EC2 role, which is going to start the servers. And then the second part of the playbook is um, mostly always the same. We're going to list all the dependencies here that we need. Uh, so with Ansible, you also have the concept of uh, metadata, and we actually got rid of that because it was like recurring, kind of messy. We had like a lot of roles. We were managing about 130 roles, and at some point wanted to be like re efficient when we wanted to upgrade the new automation. So that's why we wanted to list all the roles uh, at the playbook level, so we can easily upgrade from a version to another. And uh, finally, you're going to just introduce your main role here that you're uh, trying to build. And uh, the two final steps here, two final roles, are the roles that are required to build an AMI. And here you can see we're using like a com um, combination of tags that will help us to go as, as far as we want in the workflow process. So we can just do configure and test, or we can also create the AMI from the same playbook. Let's now talk about testing and uh, the way Ansible can help us test testing. Um, by design, uh, Ansible is, um, is designed to fail fast, meaning that if something is wrong in your configuration or in your playbook and the playbook fails, the playbook is just going to exit. So you, you will just break your workflow and exit before the AMI creation process. So that's exactly what we want. We don't want to build an AMI that's not going to work. Um, on the other side, I've talked about the uh, test part in the workflow. So Ansible can help us testing with all these uh, modules that uh, the tool provide. So the service module is going to just help you to manage your service, so start it, stop it. But then, like really interesting module like wait for, which is going to just wait for a port to be reachable on the machine. But you can also use this statement to make sure that your web server can access the database. 
So you can do really cool stuff in terms of orchestration, but also in terms of uh, like just controlling that your machine is properly set up. You can use a module like uh, URI and shells to request an endpoint, and you can register the result of this endpoint and check it later on, and make sure it returns uh, whatever code you expected or whatever string you, you were expecting. Let's now talk about uh, Docker and how Docker integrates with Ansible. So Ansible is a fully pluggable system. They provide everything comes as a plugin. Um, we talked about uh, the inventory, um, inventory files before where we can have static files but also dynamic files. So this is also a plugin. Somehow you just provide a new script and you can work with a different cloud provider. So on this side, let's talk about the co connection plugin. By default, Ansible will interact with SSH to reach your targets. But in case you're working with uh, Docker containers, you may want to use the Docker CLI to run commands across your containers. And Ansible provides a super easy way to uh, work with both kind of, um, of machines or containers, where you will just specify that you want to interact with uh, the, the Docker connection plugin instead of the default SSH plugin. And if you check, the way we call the Elasticsearch automation here is exactly the same, except the, except the limit here, where we're going to specify either the Docker container name or the Docker container ID. And on the other side, we just provide either the tag name of the server or the instance ID, uh, the IP, you name it. Why uh, we decided to introduce Docker uh, in our process, so in our test uh, process? Because, uh, like I said before, we reach about uh, 120 automations today. And I, I wanted to share this graph, uh, this diagram with you, where it shows, so the, the blue line here shows you the number of uh, DevOps people that are working in the team. So we are actually right now three people, even though it says four. So someone just uh, left us. Uh, so we are uh, right now three people. And this is uh, the red lines here, um, shows you the size of the uh, US East data center. Uh, so in Virginia, U US is the uh, Europe data center and US West uh, California. So as you see, we've grown a lot in terms of uh, servers management. It's about, I would say today, uh, more than a thousand because we have also an extra AWS account. And uh, the number of automation has just completely grown over the time. And that's why we wanted to just make sure all our automation are always working and always tested. So um, as you are, I guess, uh, most of you interested by Docker, you know that by fact, container lunch time are really fast. Um, we didn't want to use AWS, even though with um, really tiny servers, because starting a, an EC2 server in Amazon can take up to two, three minutes, and it costs money. Um, so. Imagine starting 120 servers to do all your tests to make sure that they don't overlap on each other. That wasn't, like, that wasn't a good solution for us. So that's why we went with Docker. With more efficient resource utilization, we can just uh, spin up multiple, con uh, multiple containers on the same server. Or we can also use um, whatever cluster uh, you can come up with, like ECS cluster in AWS, and run all your containers in that cluster. And containers are just disposable and cheap, which is good, because what we're looking for is just running a test and just destroy it. We don't want to make anything out of this Docker image yet. We'll maybe uh, come to that step later on, but so far it's just for testing purposes for us. So if you, rem if you remember um, the template that we've seen before with the EC2 provision and then the server automation part, we just introduced a new block here uh, before the EC2 block, so this one remained unchanged. And this one allows us to now interact with, uh, to provision Docker containers. Sensible, um, since version two, they, they, they introduced a lot of new modules to work with Docker. And um, so here we're just using a module that can help us to start new containers, and we can specify how many containers we want, if we want to expose some ports, if we want to attach a volume, and all kind of settings, pretty much that the one you can find uh, with an EC2 server, where you want to place your server in a specific region, specific subnets, and so on. So we just added this part here in our uh, template, and we're going to use this template um, to start Docker containers. 
And here, uh, on the right side, that's the only difference. So if you call the, uh, the automation with the tag provision, you're just going to start an EC2 server. And if you call it with the tag Docker, you're just going to start whatever Docker containers is behind. Let me talk about the um, concept of inventory and group vars. So I haven't mentioned that uh, before. But in Ansible, in an inventory, you have the concept of group vars, which means that's the right place where you can override variables uh, of your automations. Let's say you have a Java automation that, by default, is going to install uh, Java 1.7. If you want, for a specific use case, to run with Java 1.8, you can just override these variables in this section, in the group var section. So here, uh, this is actually the state of our uh, current production inventory, where the production here is using the EC2 dynamic inventory, which is going to grab all instances from AWS. And then we list all the group variables. Um, so we try to structure the group variables in a way that can help us to override variables uh, based on the service. So what I call it by service is just uh, the technology name, so either Cassandra uh, or Storm, or that, that's just like the global level. So as I mentioned before, if I want to run Cassandra with Java 1.8, I can define this, uh, I can override my vi variables at this level so that it's, uh, it's going to be 1.8 for um, any of my Cassandra cluster I'm going to start. Then, at, uh, at a deeper level, I'm going to define what I call here a cluster ID, which is um, variable specific to this specific cluster. So in that case, I will just override whatever configuration I need to override for my specific clusters. So here, the Cassandra.yaml uh, configuration file is going to be different from both my real-time and my analytics cluster. Let's now talk about the Docker part. And as you can see, it's actually really similar. The group bars are pretty much the same. We just like copied all these uh, group bars from one folder to another. The main difference is here, where instead of um, talking to Amazon, we're just going to talk to the Docker CLI, which is going to return all the list of running containers on my machine. And what, what's really interesting here uh, that can help us to achieve a goal I mentioned uh, when I started the, the presentation, is that you can either be really close uh, to the, the production inventory if you want to test your current behavior, but you can also defer for, for, from the production if you want to test an Elasticsearch upgrade and you're running Elasticsearch 1.x uh, in production, but you want to make sure that your automation is running with Elasticsearch 2.x, you can just change these variables in your Docker inventory, which is just your test environment, and you're just going to test uh, the new uh, software, the new Elasticsearch version. All right, so, uh, so let's just summarize uh, what we've said just before. So we've made a step ahead in terms of uh, testing our automations. We've introduced Docker uh, to just start new containers. We know that Ansible can interact with Docker containers and help us to save money and test things on, your, on our local machine or on a test server. Um, so then we can just run all our automation to test them, to configure the server and test them. And at the end of the process, that basically means that if my automation is fully tested, that means that my automation is under the percent accurate, and I'm expecting my automation to do that. As you can see, there is some room for improvements before and after. First of all, why would you run an automation if you don't check the syntax? If the syntax is bad, there is no need to do all the Docker provision and to have a failure at the test part. So that's like a preliminary, pre preliminary step that you can run before. And then after that, you may want to run extra, um, extra test. Let's say there is a concept of idempotency, which means if I run an automation against one server, I'm going to change the state of the server because I'm going to install new software. But then if I rerun right after the same automation against the same server, it shouldn't change the state because it has already reached that state that I, want, that I expected. So the idempotency, you can achieve it by rerunning the configuration part here and make sure that it's not changing anything. You may also want to run extra playbooks. Um, I mentioned uh, in the intro um, our usage of Cassandra, and we have built a whole um, 
playbook ecosystem of um, around Cassandra. And when the cluster is ready, we just don't want to destroy it. We want to run other operations. We want to make sure the rolling restart um, playbook is going to work uh, because if we need it in production, we want it to run right away. We can also introduce extra steps like uh, ServerSpect, which is a technology that can help you uh, testing and SSH or uh, reach out the, ser the server or the container using uh, Docker CLI or SSH. And you can inspect the state of the server and make sure that things are uh, what you expected and port are listening and service are running properly. Um, the reason why we chose server spec, I will get back to it later on, um, but basically we wanted to, to use a completely different tool to make sure that they both agree, like Ansible test module and server spec, they both agree on the state of the server. You can also run tools I was uh, talking about, um, checking best practices and uh, all this kind of stuff. You can achieve that using Ansible Lint, which is an open source project uh, maintained by uh, Will Tames, uh, Tames that you can, uh, you can check out this uh, uh, GitHub. And uh, so these guys work a lot on a, like a check style-like tool for Ansible, which is um, quite amazing. And finally, you may want also to run extra scripts. Let's say you don't want specially to run uh, an automation again, but you just want to run a curl command, a bash command, whatever. So it could be great to have this ability to run whatever you want against your server that is supposed to be running uh, properly. Let me introduce you to Jenkins pipelines, uh, which is quite new. How many of you have heard about Jenkins pipelines? Sweet. OK. Uh, so Jenkins pipelines, um, in contrast of freestyle jobs, allows you to define your pipeline as code and it's going to become a script-based uh, CD workflow where you can just build all your project and all your job within that script. Um, so in order to use Jenkins pipelines, you've got to use at least this version, but I will recommend you je using Jenkins too. Um, and you will need to install the pipeline plugin. And you will need to learn a bit about Groovy, uh, which is a scripting la language that uh, uh, Jenkins can interpret and is based on top of Java. Now you will say, wait, wait, wait. Right before in the introduction, I mentioned that Ansible is supposed to be an orchestrator as well. And here it sounds like I'm using Jenkins as an orchestrator. But no, I would say I want to use Jenkins because Jenkins is capable of doing continuous, con continuous integration of my project. And that's exactly the goal I'm trying to achieve. So I just want to, let's say, a developer change uh, whatever automation. Could be great to trigger the old pipeline that is using this automation. Let's say I change the Java automation. So I would like Jenkins to run all these jobs that relies on this uh, Java dependency and make sure that it didn't break whatever automation relies on Java. And there is also the concept of multi-branch uh, pipelines that can help uh, your developer and yourself to integrate new features back to the master branch. Uh, I will talk about the Jenkins pipeline, um, multi-branch pipeline, right after this slide. Uh, so this is um, basically a skeleton that's going to match my workflow I want you to do, uh, where at the beginning of the, the first statement is the node statement, which means where do I want to run this pipeline? So if I don't specify anything, the pipeline is going to run on the Jenkins master. But then if you want to run, if you are using a master-slave uh, configuration, you can specify, let's say, for whatever staging branch or whatever development branch, I want to use the slaves. But for the production pipelines, I may want to, to use the master. And even better, I may want to use an ECS cluster where I want to distribute the load and run in parallel all my pipelines to, like, prevent from any kind of limitation because of running on a single box. <coughs> now, <coughs> as you can see, we have like several steps that are called stage stages. And a stage will basically allow you to have like a really nice view on your uh, Jenkins UI. We will go through that uh, after that with the demo. So the first stage is that we're going to just pull our uh, what we call ops repo that contains all our automations. 
Then uh, we're going to define a list of playbooks that we want to test. Um, so let's say I want to build a pipeline related to my, to my big data team. I want to run all the automation that are, are related to them. So I can build a pipeline called, let's say, big data pipeline and run all the automation related to them in that uh, pipeline. This, uh, this statement here just allows us to have like, the nice uh, Ansible output uh, with the color. And then we're just going to go through all the list of playbooks one by one. And as mentioned in, the, in our workflow, we want to first run a simple uh, syntax check on our playbook. Obviously, you have something to do here. Um, so it's actually really simple because you're now using scripts based um, um, pipeline, well, script based um, uh, projects. So you can just reuse piece of configuration that you're going to split into different files. And you can just load whatever function is going to take care of the uh, playbook syntax check. So you just write it once and you just reuse it. Then we want to provision uh, Docker containers, automate the run the configuration parts across all of these containers. We want to maybe run extra playbooks if there are any, and then run Ansible lint if whatever if I want to run it, and run uh, extra automation tests. And at the end of this uh, loop, I just want to make sure I destroy all my containers so that I, the next uh, the next time I'm going to rerun the pipeline. I'm going to restart with a fresh environment without anything set up. OK, so why Jenkins Pipeline? I do have a question for you. Uh, the example above is 19 useful lines. And if you're using a classic Jenkins server, how many clicks will you do to configure that kind of pipelines? And whatever the Jenkins server goes down, how do you back up everything? How do you restore everything? Well, the question is obviously too many. Uh, that's great to click buttons, but I mean, so sometimes you prefer having code and just reuse it and super easily um, build a new project from your code. So if we um, summarize, uh, Jenkins pipelines are parts uh, integrated with your uh, um, code repository. You can obviously configure Jenkins to run a script from your code repository. So if you build something smart and at a higher level, you can just always run the same script that based on the Jenkins uh, job name is going to grab the right uh, variables and the right pipeline and just run it. You can share and import code between your pipelines and keep it dry. So just don't repeat yourself and don't, don't stop copying uh, like piece of configuration and redoing it from scratch all the time. And the great thing is that Jenkins provide the Ansible plugin that will help you to just interact with Ansible and run playbooks. So let's take a look at the Jenkins pipeline. So let me go full screen. There we go. So this is basically how our uh, Jenkins op server looks like. Uh, we've built different kind of pipelines, which are all multi-branch pipelines. Um, and we have like a different play, uh, pipeline based on their complexity and based on our needs. So we want to, I, um, we want to isolate all kind of complex pipelines like Druid, Cassandra, or whatever uh, pipeline requires like a lot of uh, different nodes. And then we can run like whatever um, different roles we have. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna look at uh, one of our role. I guess it's uh, of center customer pipeline. So they are all um, what I call multi-branch pipelines, uh, as I mentioned before. So Jenkins is basically gonna read uh, whatever is in your Git repo and check for all the branches that exist. It's gonna also get rid of all the stale branches and just gonna focus on whatever branches. So you can configure it to uh, pull specific branches based on the prefix and the regex. Uh, so here in that case, I was able to grab my staging branch, the master branch, and whatever feature I was working on at this time. Um, so when we go inside a, a project here, it's going to load here this uh, nice view. Uh, so the table over there is generated from uh, all the stages that you've listed in your Jenkins pipeline. So it allows you to know how long, what's, what was the duration for that specific step. Uh, then you can also check uh, whatever logs are related to that 
a specific check, and over there you have like the, f uh, co the total duration of your whole pipeline. And this is how it looks like when you click on one of those green boxes, and you can have like uh, specific logs related to that stage. If you prefer having the full uh, Jenkins overview, as you will have like usually, you can also check it, and you will have like all the uh, entire uh, workflow from the beginning to the end, and you can check whatever you want there. Let's uh, now take a look at the, um, how you can configure a Jenkins so that it can be aware of all your Ansible installation. If you go to global tool configuration, the place where you can add JDKs, uh, Groovy versions, whatever Maven versions, you have now a new section here which is uh, provided by the Ansible plugin section. And you can tell Jenkins that Either you've installed uh, Ansible on your local machine, so you can specify the path that it's going to use, or you can also provide um, an installer script that you're going to make like from a bash script, and it's going to just install whatever version you want to install. So this plugin is going to just help me uh, figuring out the, the, my, my first issue I mentioned, where I just want to be able to test uh, automation software upgrades, uh, automation, um, the configuration server upgrades. So I can just move from the version 1 of Ansible to the version 2 and check where it breaks. But all these tests are done in a test environment, which is pretty cool. Let's now uh, move on the another demo part where I wanted to walk through um, a whole um, automation where we're going to build it from scratch and make sure it's all integrated with Jenkins pipelines. <coughs> My example is actually a Flask uh, Hello World web app, uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, so it's Flask is based on is a micro framework based on Python. I'm just going to do a simple Hello World. So. We're going to follow our, our workflow that we listed before, and we're supposed to end up with a fully automated automation. We're going to go through the configuration part, the test part, the integration with the Jenkins pipeline. We're going to talk a bit about server spec, and finally, Ansible test. All right, uh, for the configuration part, I just like uh, drop a bunch of things because I don't want to be technical on that part. I, that's, that's not like the part that matters to me. Um, so just to give you like the, um, the main view of this uh, role, I'm just going to clone from GitHub, install pip requirements of my repo, and configure uh, the daemon UWSGI that's going to run my uh, web server. Then the test part, which is the one that is more interesting to me, uh, because like I said, you want to test something. So you need to make sure that your server is running um, as you expected. So I'm just going to stop the um, call the daemon to start my web app. I'm going to wait for the application to, um, to respond on the port 5000. And then I want even to uh, use a curl, kind of a curl, to request uh, my local host endpoint. So this first part is, is done with Ansible. That's the test part that will try to check the state of the service uh, using Ansible. And we'll see later on how we can enforce that test using server spec. Let's take a look at the Jenkins pipeline. Um, so here it looks a bit different from what we've seen from the skeleton. Actually, the skeleton that you've seen is the one that we're using. Uh, of course, I felt like all the commented part with the to-dos, so we, we, we call some functions. But we use uh, now um, what we call a strategy uh, uh, script that is going to help us to configure our pipeline. So in that script, what you'll find, I will start from at the bottom, where we, call, we define a function called get playbook list, which is going to basically contain uh, return all the playbooks I want to test in my pipeline. So in my case, I just want to test my Flask, Flask example um, playbook. And there, the strategy here is that kind of like some different switches that are going to allow me to enforce uh, step, uh, step by step like the, uh, my, my, my pipeline. And I may want to uh, skip and Sybil lint uh, for the beginning, but then enable it when I'm confident and I know that my automation is running properly. Uh, it will also tell me if I want to destroy my containers as soon as I'm done with configuring them, because for some clusters, like in, I mentioned, where 
uh, with Cassandra, you don't want to destroy your home center container because you know that Cassandra is going to require it. You want to destroy the whole stack at the end. So that's the kind of switch that's going to help us to do that. And here I can control the Ansible version I want to use for my pipeline. So I can test some upgrades here. Let's take a look at uh, how to set up uh, this web app. That's actually my Flask web app, my Hello World web app. So you will see how we can easily configure that. So we're just going to create a new item, a new project uh, that I'm going to name Flask Web App Pipeline. <coughs> and I'm going to use for that project the multi-branch uh, pipeline plugin. It's going to basically have all my branches. So this is like the configuration page where you will see that I'm just configuring minimal stuff where I just provide the uh, Git repo that I'm using and the key to access Bitbucket, and that's it. That's what I'm doing. Here I'm just suppressing automating uh, SCM triggering because I don't want Jenkins to just run all the pipelines at once when I save it. I just want to manually trigger the pipeline. So here this is the branch indexing phase where uh, Jenkins is going to go through my Git repo and try to find out where, what, which branches are active in my project. So now, here are the branches. I'm just going to test the master pipeline. I'm uh, just going to run this pipeline. So you'll say mm, there's some kind of magic behind because I just configured something really simple. I just provided the, the Bitbucket um, um, URL of my repo, and it works like this. Actually, we are using something we call the Jenkins file that stands at the root of your repo. And this Jenkins file is basically just controlling the old, um, the old um, repository integration. In our case, we're using Jenkins pipeline in a way that we don't want to build something at the end. We don't want to build a wall. We don't want to build an archive or whatever. We just want to make sure that, there you go. I don't know if you had time to check, but basically this, uh, this web app is accessed through this web app is accessed through uh, the container. So I just, I just tell the container to expose the right ports, my port 5000, to my Jenkins server. And now from the Jenkins server, I was able to reach out the UI. Um, we might want to take a look at a uh, server spec really quickly. So this is going to be the output, and then I will go through uh, the slide. Um, when, when I started working on server spec, it was Let's think about it. We have like about 130 automations, and server spec didn't exist, so we will have to write everything. And let's say now we want to make sure that we have some kind of global test that we can apply to most of our automations because we just don't want to speed code all the time and build everything from scratch. So we decided to build some uh, something like at a higher level. When you think about an automation, you're usually installing packets, you are creating folders, you are dropping files, you are usually installing a service and you expect it to be started or stopped or listening on different ports. So we came up with a bunch of, um, bunch of uh, things to test on this automation. And er, an automation can also have dependencies. And in that case, my kind of universal role, uh, my universal test is going to be you should behave like an Ansible role. And an Ansible role is something that can have dependencies, install packages, and so on. So here we just, uh, we just used our Flask example, and we have a role called command uh, that is supposed to install uh, basic uh, software on my server. So this role is going to be checked, and we just write uh, the test once, and we can just inherit from these tests when we test our Flask. Um, Web app, web app. So whatever is tested here, it's all green, tells me that it's all good. Now I'm using UWSGI as a dependency, but UWSGI should also behave like an Ansible role and test different things. And the last part here is my all the tests that I wrote to make sure that my web app is correctly listening and is correctly set up. So uh, here it tells you that it's listening on the port. It's, um, it's just running uh, properly. 
And this is just a small, I don't know if you can read it. So Ansible output is not super useful when it succeeds. It just tells you that, OK, it's all good. You're all fine with that. So we will take a look at a code a quick, uh, really quickly. The server spec test, as I mentioned before, we have like a shared repository where we're going to drop what we call universal tests. And uh, we're just going to reuse all of that in whatever in our roles that we define. So thanks to that uh, global check, our server spec file looks really tiny, and we don't have to drop a lot of uh, lines. We just have um, to make sure that the Flask, uh, my Flask um, automation, should behave as well as an Ansible role, and that's pretty much it. So if I need to here to test something that is not part of whatever I call an Ansible role, I'm just going to drop additional uh, server spec tests in that part. And here, um, so we are using server spec with um, the properties.yaml. So don't get confused. This YAML file has nothing related with Ansible. It's something completely different that is uh, pretty much hard coded, and we want to test a specific behavior. So as I mentioned before, I want to check dependencies, which are um, all my uh, playbook dependencies. I'm actually installing any, no, no, I don't have any packages installed by uh, my web app. Uh, I just want to make sure this folder is owned by ggdeploy and in the group ggapp and whatever files should be there. The ports here should be TCP and listening on port 5000. And I want to run an extra command here where I use a curl and I want to check uh, that this is returning hello world. And I want to make sure this service emperor, which is a manager of UWSGI, is running as well. Almost there. Um, let's talk about Ansible test. Uh, so Ansible Lint, uh, this project, where well, you cannot barely see anything. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but basically, Ansible Lint is going to just check uh, your whole automation and your own role. It's going to try to find out where you could improve things. Uh, so if you're using Ansible, you know that you can use shell module for whatever sometimes you're stuck. Uh, into a problem, and you say it should be like really much easier using shell than whatever Ansible module. Uh, but in that case, Ansible Lint is gonna warn you: watch out, you're using shell module. Maybe you should use something different than a curl. Let's say you could use the URI module, which is more elegant and idempotent. So it's gonna give you like a piece of advice to improve the qu the quality of the code. So if you check that um, role, it's actually working properly. But Ansible Lint is going to give me two warnings. The first one is the mode here. I should prefix my mode with an extra uh, zero at the top. And here, my git pull command will work as well. But Ansible Lint will tell me, watch out, you're, you're doing git pull without any version, meaning that I'm going to pull master all the time. So this task might not be idempotent if someone pushes code in between. So I could add. It tells me in the dark here that I could use a version statement where I can pull a specific version from GitHub. That's it. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, you can ask either in French or in English. No problem. This is the link for the slides uh, if you need it. It's already online. And this is my email if you want to shoot me an email. It's exact. Alors, c'est vrai que c'est quand même quelque chose qui est un petit peu embêtant, euh, surtout quand on est en développement d'un nouveau rôle ou de ce genre de choses. Donc, le, je veux dire, le workaround qu'on qu a trouvé, c'est que bon, quand on développe un, <coughs> un simple module, on va juste configurer un pipeline avec le nouveau, la nouvelle automatisation qu'on configure. Comme ça, on sait qu'elle est, elle est isolée dans notre pipeline quand on va la tester. Donc du coup, on peut l'intégrer avec Jenkins et être sûr que le pipeline il, il, est, il est complet et il fonctionne correctement. Et après, on va l'intégrer dans un pipeline de plus haut niveau qui va lui euh, faire tourner 10 à 15 automatisations. C'est vrai que quand il y a une automatisation qui casse, de notre côté, j'ai envie de dire, c'est pas trop trop gênant si, si ça se passe pas bien, parce que ce qu'on cherche à, à valider, c'est l'ensemble le, des automatisations. Donc en fait, en soi, tout devrait toujours tourner. Donc même quand ça fait, et c'est quelque chose qui aujourd'hui, on fait pas encore d'intégration sur des pushes sur master. On n'est pas, on fait 
fait pas du test intensif, on teste toutes les nuits, ce qui est déjà un, un, une belle amélioration par rapport à ce qu'on faisait avant. Donc du coup, quand il ça, quand ça, quand y a une, un problème, eh ben, on, on relance tout le pipeline, c'est quelque chose, on ne s'occupe pas vraiment de, de ça, c'est parti pour une demi-heure et on le laisse de côté. Mais oui, je suis d'accord avec vous que c'est assez problématique. Alors, ouais. Alors, en fait, euh, aujourd'hui, on fait attention de ne pas lancer plusieurs branches à la fois. Euh, ce, qui va, ce qui va arriver par la suite, c'est qu'on va, on va diviser euh, l'ensemble de la production. On va, on va essayer d'isoler en fait, les conteneurs sur, euh, sur différents serveurs. Donc, avoir euh, un, soit un cluster de, de production où on va lancer tous nos conteneurs de production, et euh, de l'autre côté, euh, de l'autre côté. Euh... Alors après, pour, pour les noms, on peut aussi, là, je ne sais pas si vous avez fait attention sur euh, le build, on, le nommage de nos conteneurs, ils sont faits dynamiquement. Donc on va le nommer Docker tiré et Flask Web App, par exemple, parce qu'on sait que c'est le, le conteneur qui est relié euh, à, à cette automatisation-là, ce qui va nous aider justement après à, à, à accéder à ce conteneur. Maintenant, ce qu'on pourrait faire, c'est aussi rajouter quel, à quelle branche, il, euh, à quelle branche il, est, il est associé, et donc du coup, on pourrait parce qu'aujourd'hui, en fait, on ne peut pas faire tourner et le pipeline master et le pipeline d'une branche sur les mêmes serveurs. Donc, du coup, après, en les nommant différemment, on pourrait déjà euh, on pourrait débloquer ça. Et après, avec le mapping des ports, donc après, le mapping, il est complètement... Euh, là, si j'ai euh, si deux fois ma, ma, mon appli web app euh, qui, qui va tourner, elle expose le port 5000, mais bon, il va me l'exposer sur différents ports côté Jenkins. Donc, ça devrait... Euh, je ne pense pas qu'on aurait de problème à ce niveau-là. Voilà. On pourrait les isoler comme ça. Là-haut et puis après. Alors on pourrait, alors voilà, on a, on a intégré aussi le concept d'environnement de, de, de dev sur nos serveurs, où euh, si on, on poste un flag bien spécifique dans une configuration, le, le, le l'init script qui va démarrer le service va soit démarrer en prod ou en dev. Donc on pourrait très bien penser. Aujourd'hui, on le fait pas mais on pourrait très bien penser à faire euh, tourner, à démarrer une appli en dev et à simuler du trafic et voir si elle réagit, euh, réagit proprement. Là, ça faisait un peu... Ça, donc c'est relativement bien parce que ça nous fait une intégration assez forte entre dev et ops, du coup, parce qu'on va récupérer euh, le code du dev et le faire tourner euh, un petit peu chez nous. Mais là, aujourd'hui, on a vraiment deux process différents avec un Jenkins qui est dédié aux applicatifs, où il y a euh, cet ensemble de tests qui est fait, et un, Gen un Jenkins qui est pour nous. Mais on pourrait très bien envisager de faire des tests euh, de ce genre-là. Exactement. Il ouais. Ouais. Euh, <coughs> y a des problèmes pour lancer des services et euh, des fois Ansible n'est pas capable de, de détecter. Donc là, c'est vrai qu'on utilise Docker. Euh, je pense que si on partait en production, on n'utiliserait pas du tout de cette façon-là. <coughs> là, on utilise vraiment Docker comme un serveur euh, qui nous viendrait à nous. Donc on a, on a installé différents outils dans l'image de base. On utilise une image Ubuntu où on a installé Python dedans forcément, et euh, tout un tas d'outils juste pour notre confort à nous, comme euh, un éditeur de texte, des choses comme ça, parce qu'aujourd'hui on sait qu'on va juste débugger ce conteneur, on l'utilise pour le dev. Donc euh, par rapport aux services qui ont du mal à démarrer, oui on a eu des, des problèmes, comme avec euh, par exemple des rôles comme MySQL comme, euh, ou d'autres, euh, où euh, les services de Densible, bah, la commande, le module service ne fonctionne pas proprement, par contre si on lance le script de type euh, Etsy, Nidhi, euh, MySQL, start, service start, Là, dans ce cas-là, ça démarre. Donc, du coup, on a des fois un petit switch qui dit, ben, quand tu tournes avec Docker, ben, exécute une commande shell pour démarrer le service qui va nous débloquer. Et j'ai essayé de, voilà, de chercher une solution à ça, mais je n'ai pas trouvé. Si vous l'avez, euh, je suis preneur. Alors, en fait, nous, de notre côté, on est intégré avec Bitbucket, beaucoup, euh, qui, euh, qui enfin, eux, de leur côté, ils ont un CI aussi qui s'appelle Bamboo, mais on a migré euh, vers euh, notre open source Jenkins euh, il y a plus de deux ans. Donc, euh, non, pour l'instant, c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas encore, euh, on n'est pas encore parti sur euh, tout ce qui est Travis CI, et, etc. Je ne sais pas si c'est quelque chose qu'on fera euh, dans l'avenir, mais je, je suis d'accord que Travis CI, on pourrait imaginer quelque chose de complètement similaire avec euh, un outil comme Travis CI.
termes de coût. Ouais. Merci. Ouais. Alors, on peut, <coughs> en fait, on peut et le faire d'un côté et de l'autre, on peut le faire chez Ansible avec un module qui s'appelle stat, où on peut interroger soit un fichier, un dossier, et s'assurer que, et après on peut utiliser le module assert qui va vérifier que ces droits sont bien appliqués. Aujourd'hui, on n'a pas trop poussé la phase de test, on pourrait se dire ça fait, euh, ça fait doublon. On est en train de faire euh, un test ici avec Ansible et on refait la même chose avec ServerSpec. Aujourd'hui, ce qu'on a besoin par test chez Ansible, c'est dans test, tu es censé démarrer le service et faire un, un check assez basique qui fait que voilà, mon serveur il est en train de tourner proprement. Et donc, du coup, on a vraiment délégué l'ensemble des tests chez ServerSpec euh, qui sont assez simples à écrire. Et, euh, et euh, du coup, le fait d'utiliser aussi un autre outil complètement différent, écrit même dans un langage différent qui n'a aucun lien avec Ansible, ça, on, a, on a trouvé que c'était aussi une bonne façon de vérifier que ce qui était fait était correct. Disons qu'il y, un, un, y a un bug dans le module d'Ansible qui me sert à faire mes tests, comment je sais que mes tests sont, sont viables c'était un petit peu l'idée. Donc c'est pour ça qu'on est parti avec un autre outil euh, à côté. Et ServerSpec a une communauté aussi, enfin euh, un outil assez bien maintenu qui tourne aussi sur Chef, Puppet, etc. Donc euh, voilà. Oui. On intègre le code, le code applicatif sur un autre Jenkins. Euh, sur un autre serveur Jenkins. Là, celui-là, ce, ce serveur-là, toute cette présentation-là, c'est vraiment dédié euh, aux ops euh, pour euh, nous assurer que nous, notre code de notre côté, il est quand même testé et euh, voilà, c'est vérifié. Après, est -ce que ça, ça rejoint un petit peu la question euh, par là-bas, exactement. Ou euh, bah, est-ce qu'on pourrait tester euh, l'application On pourrait avoir un test où euh, on démarre dans un environnement de test. Donc nous, quand notre, euh, peu importe, notre, notre serveur euh, qui va traiter, euh, par exemple, les images et faire de l'analyse d'images, on pourrait le démarrer en mode dev et puis euh, lui lancer euh, tout un batch de, de commandes et voir s'il réagit proprement, ce qui nous aiderait aussi à tester le niveau applicatif. Donc on pourrait pousser encore un peu plus loin. Et voilà. Exactement. Voilà. On, sait, on sait que, parce que le problème, c'est qu'avec certaines technologies, ou des fois, on, on, voilà, un cluster Kafka, euh, moi j'ai oublié comment ça marchait Kafka, parce que ça fait un an que je n'y ai pas touché, mais l'automatisation, elle est toujours là. Et euh, c'est de se dire, si demain on perd un nœud, il faut qu'on soit capable de le remplacer, est-ce que l'automatisation, elle va toujours marcher Donc du coup, c'est vraiment une validation au niveau, au niveau infra. Et on sait que euh, si on bascule en prod, étant donné qu'on fait tourner l'automatisation avec les mêmes variables, et bon, on sait que ça va, il y a de grandes chances de marcher. Enfin, il y a de grandes chances de marcher. Voilà. Merci, oui, désolé. Oui, je suis là toute la journée. N'hésitez pas à venir me voir, euh, poser des questions, discuter. Euh. Merci beaucoup.